Richmond. Hello and welcome to coverage of Grand Prix Richmond. I'm Marshall Seckliffe in the booth with Reed Duke and we are ready for the finals. We've got Mike Sigrist on blue black mid range facing off against Alex Hahn on a black red aggro. Reed, if you had to pick a favorite, we kind of went through a few minutes ago on our pregame about what the differences were and how some of the cards matched up. Do you have a sense for if one of them is, uh, is ahead in this matchup? Boy, it's very close. Okay. Um, this matchup is very close. I think black red is a little advantage in the matchup, but a blue black player could not have made it this far in the tournament without having a very, very good winning record against black red aggro. Um, so I think the matchup is close enough that the fact that Mike Sigrist is on the play for game one and the more experienced player of the two, I'm picking him to win, uh, not based on the cards, but just based on the positioning and, and who he is. Okay. Good start here for Sigris, by the way. He has Ether Hub into Siphoner, and that gives him the two energy needed to cash that in for a life and a card. And he's already up a card now. Yeah, the dream start for the blue-black mid-range deck is having uh, not only turn two Glint Sleeve Siphoner, but often Ether Hub so that you can draw your card on turn three. We highlighted before the match the interaction of Goblin Chain Whirler taking out Glint Sleeve Siphoner and Champion of Wits. That's something that changes a lot based on the play or the draw. And here you see with Mike Sigrist on the play, he's able to get the Siphoner and draw a card off of it, both before Alex Hahn even has three mana. Mike si signaling his intent here by not attacking with that Glint Sleeve Siphoner, saying, you know, I'm in the, in the market for a trade, and Alex obliges him. Sigrist is now deciding what removal spell he'd like to use on Kerry Zev. He also had Supreme Will at his disposal. Yeah, so Mike, just everything going the way he wants it. Um, he's got the Siphoner on turn two, already gained value off of it. Multiple options available to him on turn three. He's got his fourth land all set up, so everything's going perfectly for him so far. That said, we are almost to four mana for Alex, which is where the must-answer threats start coming in, and he's going to start throwing them at Mike and saying, can you answer this one? Can you answer this one? And it really only takes one to stick to get a board advantage on Alex's side of the battlefield. So let's see what he's got here for us on turn four. I see he has a Chandra already for sure. There's a Glorybringer for next turn. Has her at the Fervent perhaps as well. He's going to go with the Chandra. So Mike has the option to counter this with Supreme Will, which is what he's going to do. But if you saw Reed, he also has one of the key cards in the matchup, Vraska's Contempt in hand, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mike's prepared for the next three threats. Well, two now, but one yeah. with Supreme Will, one with Vraska's Contempt, one with Commit Memory. He is going to have to find another black mana source, though, if he wants to cast that Vraska's Contempt, isn't he? True. He did pick up a Swamp. He also could take the long route of Field of Ruining Alex Hahn. And searching for a swamp. By the way, I was watching Mike play his semifinal match, and boy, he plays those Field of Ruins like a violin, my friend. I was really impressed with that. He was able to cast Commit twice to set two very valuable permanents on top of the library, and then from his hand, play Field of Ruin and just shuffle them away. And boy, it went from pretty tense, because it was like, hey, those things are coming back, Mike. Like... <laughs> And he used it as a way to just get rid of them permanently, it was, or at least semi-permanently. It was really impressive. Okay, here's Glorybringer now for Alex Hahn, which is allowed to resolve by Mike, but that's only because he already had the answer in his hand with Vraska's Contempt. So once again, things going right, uh, the right way for Mike Segrist. What happens, though, when he wants to start taking over again? Right. I mean, he's playing the control route here, just keeping everything at bay. What happens when he starts to turn the corner? Well, that card that he just deployed, Champion of Wits, that's a big part of it. Kay. That can both dig him to action or eventually, you know, you figure against a red-based aggro deck, it's going to find its way into the graveyard. And as soon as Mike has seven lands, nothing to do with him, he can restock his hand. So the game plan for Mike is trade, 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 and then once he's done trading, once he's taken a little bit of the wind out of Alex's sails, then he's going to 
use one of his big get-ahead type cards like Champion of Wits or the Scarab God. This was super interesting here from Sigris because I think he was really hoping that there would just be one big threat left for Alex because he's leaning on this Doomfall. But there are two, so Sigris gets to take care of one of these. And then Alex gets to untap and say, okay, well, I'm going to cast the other one. Both of them very difficult to deal with. He's going to let him keep the Phoenix because of the uh, immediacy. <laughs> yeah, no haste on that one. At right. A least. little less immediate there. I think Alex just drew another Hazret. Oh, that's a little justice. Maybe I maybe I missed saw. Well, he he's going to play the the Phoenix either way. Interesting. Mike discarded commit memory. He's got another Vraska's Contempt in his hand, and this could be a pretty good turn for him as well. I think he drew a Glint Sleeve Siphoner. One unknown card for Alex Hahn. There's a Siphoner. I guess there's no real reason to fire it off right now. He's going to wait until Alex is tapped out. The, the, the only interaction there would be Alex killing his own Phoenix. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, but that c that came up. Alex used that technique in uh, Game 3 against Seth Manfield oh. just a moment ago. He killed his own Phoenix in response to Vraska's Contempt. And it turned out Seth had another removal spell, but, but he had to burn that removal spell instead of the Phoenix just being exiled permanently. Okay, so Sigrid's just anticipating that Scrap Heap Scrounger coming back and staying patient and then firing off the Vraska's Contempt. Nice tight play there from Siggy. Absolutely. He is facing down a Scrap Heap Scrounger, but we saw him pretty readily trade off earlier, and I'm sure he'd do again. And there's another Rekindling Phoenix now for Alex. The hits keep coming. What is Mike on? Six lands? He doesn't have seven yet, does he? No, no, but ironically, Alex wants to work pretty hard to make sure that Champion of Wits does not get into the graveyard because... The game's playing out in such a way where he's not going to be able to drop life, Mike's life total quickly. He's going to have to take the slow route of, of chipping in for four, potentially six attacks. Mm. Um, and in the course of that long game, if Mike gets to draw four cards and discard two, you know he's going to find action. He's going to find removal and, and, and ruin your plans. Ooh, Ooh, speaking of ruin your plans, Reed, here's Goblin Chain Whirler for Alex Hahn. A great draw for him. It's going to clear away both creatures on Mike Sigrist's side of the battlefield, and that's seven damage. Yeah, but what I'm telling you, Marshall, is that <laughs> this is, could be a double-edged sword with uh, the Champion of Wits now hitting the graveyard. If Mike gets stuck, draws a few too many lands, now he can look down and have that. Mm. Although, I think, all things considered, the, the Chain Whirler provided enough free value and enough tempo advantage that um, that becomes less of a concern, and it, it was a really profitable play for Alex Hahn. Sigrist looks like he's getting a little uh, champion flooded here. I think he's got two of those in an island in his hand now. Maybe just one extra. Boy, a moment ago it seemed like Mike had a fairly stable position, but you're right, losing those two creatures, now getting attacked on the ground. It's pretty tough for him. I think he's got to discard the two champions and keep his land. Trade off for Scrounger, take seven down to eight, and then from there start his <coughs> comeback. Yeah, his life total is going to be under pretty significant duress here. And look at this. Great draws here from Alex Hahn. He has unlicensed disintegration. He does control an artifact as well, so this is going to put Mike on a one-turn clock. I don't see any way out now. Unbelievable. Wow. What, a, what a turn of events. Huge swing back in Alex Hahn's direction. <laughs> look at the life totals. It's 18 to 2. Just goes to show you how punishing this black red deck is. Y you can't, you can't let anything stick. It, the the creatures just kill you too fast. Right, because remember the key moment there was Mike Sigrist was able to keep all threats off the battlefield for the first three, four, five turns of the game, and then he had that one turn where he played the champion, and then he played Doomfall. There was three cards left in hand for Alex, and one of them was a land. It was Hazaret and a Rekindling Phoenix. And from there, it was Rekindling Phoenix, Rekindling Phoenix, Goblin Chain Whirler, and uh, the hits keep coming. 
Mike Sigris wasn't able to keep up. So game one goes to Alex Hahn. And the players are now going to check out their sideboards. Yeah, from the turn four position, Mike had Supreme Verdict, Vraska's Contempt, and Commit Memory to take care of the next three plays from Alex Hahn. But Alex had three plays and more. The top of his library kept delivering, and Mike's did not. You know, he would have been okay given an extra turn or two of breathing room to unearth, to eternalize those Champion of Wits. But the red-black deck was not having that. There was no <laughs> breathing room. And, of course, you know, it is worth mentioning that that is one of the big benefits to playing the deck in the format that simply has the best cards available, right? I mean, there's a lot of other cool synergies. There's a lot of good build-arounds in Standard right now. People are playing a lot of different decks. But the deck that has the individual highest average card quality is certainly this red-black deck, and we got to see that there. Sure, Mike dealt with a bunch of stuff, but there was a couple things left over, and they're just extremely powerful. When you look at other decks, even like the one that... Mike is playing here. You know, if Alex had a, if it, things were reversed, he might be facing down a 2-1. Like, that could have been the leftover card for Mike. Instead, it's 4-3 flying that it's really hard to get rid of, or some Planeswalker, or even something like a Goblin Chain Whirler. It's very true. Just, just the raw card quality of this black-red deck makes it hard to compete with. Yeah. So, it's worth pointing out, this is a repeat matchup of the finals of Grand Prix LA two weeks ago. That was Logan Nettles with Black Red against Ben Friedman, Blue Black Midrange. And there it was, Logan Nettles with Black Red, who, who prevailed. Seems to be the way the wind is blowing here as well, but we'll see if Mike Sigris can make a comeback. Siggy on the right-hand side of your screen getting shuffled up and ready while Alex Hahn just finishes up his sideboard plans. It looks to me like the bigger changes will be on Sigrist's side after sideboarding. He'll be bringing in any combination of cast down, double essence extraction, infernal reckoning, um, and potentially changing his conf creature configuration a little bit. But those four extra cheap removals coming at the expense of probably the Glint Sleeve Siphoner um, whereas Alex Hahn, no structural changes. He can turn to Magma Spray if he would like. A nice, clean answer to Champion of Wits. Um, he's got another Glorybringer that I would expect to come in. He could choose Doomfall if that's something he's interested in. And I think his weakest card might be uh, Rekindling Phoenix, unless he wants to trim some of his removal. A Braid is, I guess, a, a flexible slot as well. <laughs> Remind you, these players are playing for quite a bit of money here. $10,000 is going to go to the first place finisher. And uh, they're going to get eight pro points as well as a trophy that they get to keep forever. Sigris has been here before. He is a GP champion. Siggy, of course, a consummate professional when he's playing Magic as well. Very communicative. He's, uh, he's kind of like you, Reed. Yeah, Mike's a real good guy. He's uh, somebody that doesn't use any angle shots or intimidation tactics. Just a real clean, honest player. Very nice guy. Mm -hmm. Can't really say enough good things about Mike Sigrist. Looks like we've got a mulligan here. He's one of those people who's almost universally, universally well-liked by anyone who knows him, which is... Uh, it really doesn't take long to like Mike. You know, you, you, like I said, I was around him for about five minutes doing a winter interview, and I'm like, I like that guy. Mm -hmm. And that has not changed, and that was years ago. <laughs> well, that is a pretty good first impression, I guess, on both sides, either, mm. either receiving or delivering a trophy. True. You guys are going to be fast friends. Yeah, that's true. We've been through it all, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it looks like we've got a keep here from Alex. In case you were wondering, Alex did not touch those Bomat Couriers after sideboarding. He still wants those fast starts. Plan A, and he's got it. Bomat Courier cracking into the red zone, getting a card exiled, passes a turn back to Sigrist. 
I wonder then if Sigrist will turn to Fungal Infection. Really, really nice, profitable answer to a one toughness creature. He has that? One Fungal Infection in his sideboard. Boy, I like that one. Oh, it would be really good here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Look at Alex. He's like, I hope you don't have that Fungal Infection, man. All right, he doesn't have it. Fatal Push is what he was going to have to settle for, but Fungal <laughs> Infection would have been a blow out there. So Fatal Push kills one Bomac Courier. Yeah, that Bomac Courier is, is just in the graveyard like normal. Right. What? Yeah. We made an exile sandwich out there, but there <laughs> we go. Was there no follow-up play there for Alex? Nothing else. Okay. Well, so just Bomat, 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 go. Bomat, yeah. Okay. That was only his turn two, not his turn Sure, three. sure. Champion of Wits now for Sigrist. He's going to discard another copy of Champion as well as an Ether Hub. Pass the turn back to Alex. Land number three. And that's exactly what he wants to see here. Goblin Chain Whirler. We pointed that out in our pregame. Champion of Wits and uh, Glint Sleeve Siphoner. Weak to Chain Whirler. And there you go. Sigris is going to play Sorceress Spyglass here. And he's going to see a f mighty fine target there with Chandra Torch of Defiance. Excellent, excellent. We saw Sorceress Spyglass do some, some pretty bad work, some poor work in uh, the quarterfinals um, where it, it didn't reveal anything to, uh, to shut off. But here it's perfect, a preemptive answer to Chandra, which we had talked about the dynamic in this matchup where the black-red aggro player gets to play Chandra, kill something on the opposing side, and then Mike Sigris has to use a removal spell after the damage has already been done. But here, a preemptive answer is fantastic. And the bonus, the icing on the cake, is that it shuts off any future Ch Chandras that Alex Han might pick up. Alex plays his Ether Hub, giving him land number four. And it looks like he drew Kerry Zev for the turn. He also has Doomfall in his hand, but he's decided just to get out on board here. Rather than worry about what Mike might have going on in his hand. Oh! Cycle of Sensor. Looks like Mike's trying to find another copy of, uh, of Fatal Push, or maybe even that Fungal Infection we mentioned. We've seen a lot of but Doom no. Falls over the course of the day, but something to really stress about that card is it's at its best when you can answer a card that your opponent has already invested mana into. See, on that turn, Alex Hahn could have spent his whole turn, spent all of his mana, mm -hmm. and taken away a card from Mike's hand, but then Mike just gets to cast his second best card. So focusing both on the long-term planning and the tempo aspects at the same time w will lead you to, to make the best decisions with Doomfall. Mike has land number five here. What does he have to play? Cycle another sensor. He did take four damage last turn from the Chain Whirler and the Bomac Courier. He's down to 12. One of the weaknesses of the blue-black mid-range deck is it doesn't really have a reset button. It's more focused on one-for-one -one answers. And uh, if, if the board spirals out of control like it's starting to do here, Mike Sigris facing down three potent threats. If he can only answer one per turn, while taking massive damage or letting more cards grow under that Bomat Courier, um, then it's really hard for him to come back one removal spell at a time. It looks like Alex doesn't have anything else to do, so he's going to go for the Doomfall now. Take a look at Mike's hand, but Mike is going to respond. He did actually find a Fatal Push now. Does he have anything else to do? Oh, Scarab God gets exiled and leaves Mike with just a land. Here's four more damage. Mike's going to be at 8, and he's top decking. Yeah, Mike needs Mike needs a lot of help. He needs a big draw here, and then after that, a 7th land might be okay to, uh, to eternalize the champion, but he cannot pass the turn doing nothing this turn. Okay, he's passed the turn yet, but perhaps he has an answer for one of these threats. An instant speed answer, that is. Gear Hulk, Raskus yeah. Contempt. Those are the type of haymak haymakers that he needs. Gear Hulk would be amazing here. But he just takes the damage. He's down to 4. 
As this one slipped away from Sigrist. Another land for him, and all he can do is eternalize the champion of wits. Oh, and there it is. Unlicensed disintegration with the trigger on the stack, and Alex Hahn wins Grand Prix Richmond. Wow, fantastic stuff. Uh, Boy. Game two looked like it was more or less according to plan. He had the nice start with double Bomat Courier curved out well. Sigrist missed a beat. But game one was the one that really impressed me there, where he was able to make a comeback, fight through all of those removal spells. And then once he started sticking threats, just the life total goes from 23 to 0 in, in the blink of an eye, a snap of a fingers. Yeah, Alex was just completely relentless in both of those games, just presenting threat after threat after threat after threat. And... Mike stumbled in both of them, mm -hmm. couldn't find an answer for a couple of them, and then his life total just plummeted. Yeah, part of the difference, I think, is that the blue-black deck, it has its threats and it has its answers. We talked about Mike needing Supreme Will into Vraska's Contempt into a go-over-the-top type card. But Alex, all of his cards are both threats and answers. So Chain mm -hmm. Whirler, kill your creature, attack next turn. Chandra, mm -hmm. kill your creature, have a Planeswalker. So, you know, there's less that can go wrong on the black-red side, and we did see things go wrong for Mike Sigurist not having the uh, go-over-the-top cards that he needed. Yeah. Eventually, those cards chip away at you, you know, whether it's Chandra for two a turn or Goblin Chain Whirler for three a turn, plus the one that you get automatically, your life total gets chipped away at. And then usually what happens is there's something with four or five power that just goes bang, and you're dead. Yep. And that's exactly what happened here. So great run for Mike Sigurist, but Alex Hahn, he is our champion here in Richmond. We're going to be bringing him in the booth momentarily here for a little interview. And uh, it's been a, quite a weekend, has it not? Yeah, it's been a great weekend. We saw some good action in Legacy yesterday. And uh, here we're taking a look at the final bracket. We're bringing right. Alex in. Thanks, Reed. Put this thing on there, Alex. And we'll get you in here for your winner interview. Yeah, just like that. And there you go. Alex, welcome to the booth. Congratulations, man. You are our champion here in Richmond. Let's get this nice trophy in the shot as well. Boy, you did not have an easy road there. In the semis, you had to beat uh, you had to beat um, Seth Manfield, and then you had to beat Mike Sigrist after that. Yeah. They just lined him up, but you just knocked him out. Greatest upset of all time, probably. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say that for? You, you yeah. crushed him. I don't know. I those guys were just so good. I couldn't believe it. Yeah, you, you did have the hardest road through the top eight. We've been taking a look at the bracket, and I'm just like, wow, that looks rough. You had to beat Joel Sadowski and then Manfield and then uh, and then Sigris, but you did it. What made you pick your red-black deck? You know, it's kind of the deck in standard. Did you do any tweaking to it? What was your thought process there? Well, I've basically just been playing it the whole year, so mm. it's the deck I just felt most, most comfortable with. Okay. And what's your stat right now? So you qualify for the Pro Tour from this top eight. Um, where are you? Are you trying to get to silver, gold? Like, what, where are you at on the, the pro scene here? Uh, I think I needed a top eight to hit bronze. And oh, I, guess I got there. Congratulations. <laughs> That's great. So we'll see you for sure at one Pro Tour. And I, I like uh, your chances of hitting another one as well. Congratulations, yeah. man. Great job. I appreciate it. You got the trophy too. And you get to take home all that money and everything as well. Yeah. Nice work. So that's going to do it, of course, for us here from Richmond. Quite a weekend. Thank you so much for joining us for it uh, and for going for our experiment with uh, GP Reed Duke. We had a great time doing it. Really appreciate all the feedback that we've gotten for that. Thank you so much for that. I want to thank everybody here that helps make these tournaments possible in the room. Alex, you know, the judges and the staff, boy, they are indispensable when it comes to making a GP run. Thank you so much to everybody here from Channel Fireball Events and the judges that help make these things possible. And of course, thank you to you. Thanks so much for joining us. We've got GP Detroit next weekend. That is Team Unified Modern. And we're also bringing you coverage of Japanese Nationals that same exact weekend. It's going to be a jam-packed weekend full of live and recorded magic for you. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time.